before we jump into this class, I just want to give you a short introduction of what's going on in this class. We're talking about where, when, who, what, why, and how of the Feast of Weeks. Some call it uh, Pentecost, or it could be called the Sh Shavuot. We've combined several classes into one class in order to get a lot of information in this class. And I would advise that you watch it all the way through to the end, maybe even consider watching it more than once because it does have a lot of information in here. We tried to get it in everything we could into this one little short video about uh, the Feast of Weeks. Um, <clears throat> this is a holy day feast that we're talking about. And as with all holy day feasts, this is a watch day for many people around the world. Um, that's why we were sure to put in, you know, the, the date of the Feast of Weeks and even went far as to show you how we did, how we calculated, how we came up with the date. Um, but it is a watch date for those who are waiting for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But it's also a watch date for any of you tribulation watchers and those who are waiting for the rapture or the change that we're all expected to go through. Oh, and go ahead and hit the subscribe button and the like button. It's easier to, you know, remember to do it now than to remember to do it later. And so go ahead and hit that now. All right. Love y'all. Hey, y'all. Coach in the fight here. Working on Pentecost. Yep. We have another Holy Convocation Day coming up, one of the mandatory feasts, one of the three mandatory feasts is coming up very soon. And so I wanted to come on and do what we normally do during when we're this close to a feast, and that's go in and verify the exact dates. But before, while I was working on that, coming up with the exact dates, I came across this chapter here in the Book of Jubilees. Um, but I'm going to start right here on 32. He says, And commanded thou the children of Israel that they observe the years according to this reckoning, 364 days. And these will constitute a complete year, and they will not disturb its time from its days and from its feast, for everything will fall out in them according to their testimony. And they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feast. Okay, so that's what should be jumping out to you first. You know, especially you guys who, who aren't familiar with sacred calendars or the Hebrew calendar or anything like that. 364 days, 364. Now, of course, our Gregorian calendar says there's 365 and one quarter days. According to everything that I've read in scripture, like I said, including Jubilees, including Enoch, um, and other books that talk about these the, the actual calendar we find out that there are 364 days 364 days all right let's look at verse 33 but if they do neglect and do not observe them according to his commandments and they will disturb the seasons and the years will be dislodged and they will neglect their ordinances okay now look at this 33 is saying that if we forget that there are 364 days, they will disturb all of their seasons, meaning you won't know what season we're in and the year. We'll lose track of the years. Um, and what does it say? And they will neglect their ordinances. They will not keep up with the ordinances. Now, when we look at what ordinances means, these are the orders from the Father. These are the orders of the Most High. These are those rules that we hear about in the Scripture, those rules that the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug says are antiquated and we should not be following. Um, this, this is why he is like this. This is what happened uh, when we go back to Jubilees. It's because humanity as a whole has lost track of these 364 days and we have since lost track of the ordinances as well. You're reading right there in scripture, if we do this, this will happen. If we forget about these days, then we will lose the ordinances and we find ourselves both in, in both cases. We have forgotten about the ordinances and what do you know? We've forgotten about the 364 days too, so the Bible is real. 
Let's look at 34. And all of the children of Israel will forget and will not find the paths of years and will forget the new moons and seasons and Sabbaths and it will go wrong as to the order of the years. This is exactly where we're at, guys. We've forgotten the new moons. They, does anybody even know how to tell when a new moon is or even what a new moon is? The seasons, we don't know... Um, um, which holy season we're in or we've forgotten about the holy seasons um, there are supposed to be um, uh, feast celebrations that we have both in the spring and in the fall we don't keep it we don't keep track of those anymore and the Sabbaths um, you got people arguing whether this Sabbath day is on Sunday arguing whether the Sabbath day is on Monday but when you follow the 364 day calendar you find out that the Sabbath day changes sure it may fall on Sunday one month but it may fall on Tuesday another month or Wednesday another month and Friday so to say hard and fast that the Sabbath day always falls on Sunday or Saturday puts us in error so in other words we've forgotten about the Sabbath days too and it says and they will go wrong as to the order of the years now we now this is important because we remember that the father in his infinite wisdom he laid out his eschatology with days on it he told us how long how many days we would have before certain events would happen um, you can read some of those in book in the book of Daniel and you can um, also read them in the book of Adam and Eve where he told Adam and Eve that they had five days or five thousand five hundred years before his word would come to save them talking about Yehoshua HaMashiach our Messiah but he also told him at day seven which is day which is seven thousand five hundred years we would get rest so there's a lot of people now talking about um, the uh, the rapture or the spiritual change that we're supposed to go through they're talking about the tribulation um, there's a lot of people mocking because these these people who are diligently searching out for the truth are making errors in their calculations and the dates that they're calling out are coming and going without any material manifestation well this is the reason why we've lost track of the years we don't we don't know exactly what year it is it's because we're using the wrong amount of days in each year all right, let's go on to 35. For I know and from henceforth will I declare it unto thee. It is not for my own devising, for the book lies written before me. And on the heavenly tablets the division of days is ordained, lest they forget the feast of the covenant and walk according to the feast of the Gentiles after their error and after their ignorance. All right, this again, guys, is exactly where we're at. This is proof that we have, that, that the scripture is correct, that we have lost track of these 364 days. Why does it say, lest they forget the feast of the covenant? See, we're not keeping the feast of the covenant. Some of you guys listening to this will remember the feast like Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, atonement day, tabernacles, uh, Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, um, and the Feast of Boots. I think I named all seven of them. But you know, most folk have no idea that these feasts exist. And when you start talking about holy days, they their mind pops to holidays where they've taken the Y out of the day or the. the um, pointing to our father and replaced it with an I in the day pointing to ourselves our, our holy days is about the father while their holidays are about us what we're going to get what we're going to do what we you know it's all about us and so that's what that's what he's talking about there he says lest they forget the feast of the covenant and walk according to the feast of the Gentiles 36 says for there will be those who will surely make observations of the moon how it disturbs the seasons and comes in from year to year 10 days too soon all right now we're talking about the disconnect he's talking about the disconnect between the Gregorian calendar and the uh, Hebrew calendar or the sacred calendar if there anybody who's studied this um, to any degree knows that there is a disconnect between the days because the moon doesn't line up with the sun they fall they, they don't fall in, in in an exact order I'm trying to remember my old engineering classes but I think a sun day is approximately 31 days while a moon day is approximately 28 days and so it doesn't line up it doesn't come out it doesn't come out right 
all right and what he's saying here those who observe the moon when they're trying to calculate the feast days will find themselves in error it's going to come out in error you have to go you have to go by the days prescribed you can't look at the sun you can't look at the moon you have to look at the days as prescribed in order to stay on track for this reason the years will come upon them when they will disturb the order and make an abominable day the day of testimony and an unclean day a feast day and they will confound all the days the holy with the unclean and the unclean day with the holy and they will go wrong as to the months and sabbaths and feasts and jubilees this is exactly where we're at guys that's why you have so many people when you come around these feast days especially like passover and atonement day and 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 those big days when we're really expecting something supernatural to happen you have a lot of people that get on and start trying to calculate those days and what ends up happening is they end up calling out other days they end up saying you know that the Passover falls on a different day than what you calculate based on Enoch based on Moses based on Jubilees based on the information in the text and so what essentially they're doing is what is said here is they're picking an a, a unholy day or an abominable day and making it a holy day in other words they're having they're having their holy feast on a unholy day on the wrong day they, they choose it on the wrong day and we know it's very important to have the feast on the correct day you can't just do it whenever you feel like it kind of deal it's, it's a, a very specific time or a very specific day that he wants each feast to fall on but if you're not keeping up with the 364 days you're going to miss it you're going to be on the wrong day you're going to mess up um, in verse 38 says for this reason I commanded and testified to thee that thou mayest testify to them for after thy death thy children will disturb them so that they will not make the year 364 days only and for this reason they will go wrong as to the new moons and the seasons and Sabbaths and festivals and they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh all right now rem now the, the, the chapter six it starts off talking about noah and his um journey on the boat there on that ark and you know and so that's pretty much what it's about in the first part of the uh chapter and it kind of switched gears a little bit at chapter 32 where we picked up in this bible study but look this is what he's telling noah he's telling if you remember um that there were eight people on the ark with Noah. It was Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And what he's telling Noah is, and these these were the only people left on the planet, you know, that we know of until you start reading between the lines there in Genesis chapter 6. But from 10,000 feet, these are the only people left on the planet. And what he's telling Noah is that after you die, after you die, Noah, this is what's going to happen. He says, um... Uh, for after thy death, thy children will disturb them, meaning they will stop keeping track of the 364 days after Noah's death. This is what he was told. And if you remember what happens, you kind of don't hear anything from the, from the father's people from Noah all the way up to Abraham. It's like Abraham was the first one who started reckoning these days according to the scripture. But, you know, that was a long period of time from from Noah to Abraham but look what he says for after thy death thy children will disturb them so that they will not make the year 364 days only and for this reason they will go wrong as to the new moons we are now wrong as far as the new moons they will go wrong as far as the seasons we are wrong as far as the seasons they will go wrong as far as the Sabbath days we don't know when the Sabbath day is and the festivals we are having a hard time coming up with when these when these festival days are and they will eat all kinds of blood with all kinds of flesh Remember, we are trying to repair the breaches. We're trying to restore the paths to dwell in, meaning we're trying to get back on track. And one of the things we know is that these feast days and the Sabbath days are extremely important to get back on track. It could possibly be the most important thing we can do to get back 
on track to restore the paths to dwell in is to get back into these feast days and start keeping these feast days again we can read in the book of jubilees there how we got off track in the first place all right so retracking our steps and finding out um how the lord keeps time specifically when he expects us to keep our holy feast days will go a long way to get get us back on track if not get us there on his own Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, over here at Herman's Academy. We're always getting questions about the Third Testament of the Bible. I want to take a minute just to go ahead and familiarize you guys with the Third Testament of the Bible. I'm even going to give you a, a link at the end of this. Uh, some of the points about the Third Testament of the Bible is that it is the third part of the trilogy we know as the Bible. It's broken up into three parts, turns out. You have the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Third Testament. <laughs> And this is what's going to teach us wisdom. Another point to bring out about the Third Testament, it is the little book promised in Revelations chapter 10. But before we get there, let's look at John chapter 1, which says that God is the Word. When you read John chapter 1 verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Let's look at Revelations chapter 10. The first two verses of Revelations chapter 10 is where we get the promise of a new little book. But if you look at close at verse 2, it says, and he had in his hand a little book open and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot upon the earth right? now let's look over here on further down in Revelations chapter 10 and we see that at the trumpet blast the seventh trumpet blast we're supposed to get another little book everybody at the seventh trump is going to get the third testament of the Bible in one way or the other but I'm gonna give you a couple of links here let me look over here at, at Revelations chapter 19 verse 11 says and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he does judge and make war this is the this is the second coming of Yehoshua HaMashiach this is the second coming of Christ this is the Messiah coming this is the day we're all waiting for when the Messiah comes down on his white horse uh, with his angels surrounding him at the seventh trump but let's look right here at verse 13 and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God so when the Messiah comes back his name will be called the Word of God and, and why because he's always been known as the Word of God and now that we are getting the third testament of the Bible the completing the trilogy we have him all together we have his three parts we have the love we have the law and now we have the wisdom to where we can get a full understanding of who our father is Hermes Academy First, giving glory and honor to the Most High, our Father in heaven, hallowed be his name, who created the heavens and the earth. We're going to look at verse 15 and 16. We're going to take a few notes here. It says, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, even seven Sabbaths shall be complete, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord now some of the things that we need to pull out before we get into exactly when this feast day is we have to look at what it says it says uh, from the morrow after the Sabbath now we, we, we got a PowerPoint over here and we're gonna put all of these um, up here um, we're gonna take a note of what they are but that's one of the things we got we got the morrow after the Sabbath from the day that he brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Now, as far as I'm counting, that's two of them right there. Seven Sabbaths complete. So we got two um, uh, requirements out of verse 15. Now let's look at verse 16. It says, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Now, there's another one to me looks like morrow after the seventh Sabbath and another one says number 50 days. So the day that he's talking about is in the previous feast. If you come up here and you look at the feast of first fruits, that was the uh, 
other feasts. You remember, and this one covers all of them. You can go up and look at Passover, uh, the Sabbath day, and unleavened bread is in that one too. You just have to um, read it in between the lines. I guess it didn't give you a head in there. But um, here you have uh, the feast of first fruits. Now, if you look, it says. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now, the Sabbath that he is talking about, you have to come up here and look in here for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which falls on a Sabbath day. This is a, uh, a high holy feast day here that falls on a Sabbath day. But to help me out with all of this, I'm going to skip a little and I'm going to punt on it, so to speak. But I'm going to come over here to a video that we put up um, a little while ago called When is Passover Unleavened Bread First Fruits Sabbath Day 2019. And in that class, one of the, in, that, in that video, one of the things that we talk about is how we were actually able to verify the new moon for ourselves. We was actually able to see it. You know, one of the first times we've ever seen it, if not the first time. And but we actually laid our eyes on it so we know that these this date is hundred percent accurate. A hundred percent accurate. Alright, in this one you get down to the Passover and unleavened bread and the first fruits, and that's why we were doing it to make sure that we had these days lined up. And they did match up with what Google had and uh, their Gregorian calendar and everybody else had it all. There was no issue, nobody. Um gave any negative feedback or anything it's just that using this we can actually show you where these dates are actually falling if you remember in the other video and jump back over there it says abib that's the first month of the hebrew calendar or the sacred calendar or, or the Enoch calendar but it corresponds in 2019 just should have put that there in 2019 it corresponds with april in such a manner all right and you can look down. So, in, let me jump over here. So, and this is the April column. So, we can see that first fruits, the money that he's talking about, is on the 22nd. It's actually the 16th day of the Hebrew uh, um, uh, calendar. And if you remember, the Sabbath days fall on the, um, some say the first, but it's the 8th, it's the 15th, it's the 22nd, and the 29th. So that was the Sabbath day, or the 16th being the day after, it's the 22nd, and that's the day of first fruits that we were talking about over there in uh, Leviticus 23. Alright, so now we're going to come over here to this tab. So this is on timeanddate.com where we, you can go in and punch in the dates. And what we put in was April 22nd and we added 50 days. We added 50 days to it and the number that we get is Tuesday, June the 11th. Tuesday, June the 11th. And it appears to be June the 11th, 2019, according when we meet the requirement of the uh, 50 days. Just punch it in 50 days. Okay? But now, we have to make sure it meets the other requirements. This is where a lot of the other guys are going to fall apart when they start messing around and trying to come up with the exact date of the Feast of Weeks because of these requirements here and making them make sense. If you use any other calendar besides the Enoch calendar, you are not going to get these four requirements. And if you think you have a correct calendar, if you think the calendar you're going by, I don't care what kind of calendar it is, if you think the calendar that you're going by is correct, m make this feast of weeks line up with these four requirements. And you can you can pat yourself on the back and be like, yep, I got it. I knew it. I knew it. But we're going to go on. Looking at our requirements here, we have one of them checked off, number 50 days, that was easy, just put in 50 days, but let's see about this one, see if June 11th falls on, tomorrow, on the morrow after the Sabbath day. Now, <clears throat> in order to do that, we have to find out when the first day of the month is, and this is how you would calculate a Sabbath day. 
we used the sun and moon data for one day from the U.S. Naval Observatory. Um, and what we do is come in and find when it says the new moon is. Now, according to this, the new moon fell on June the 3rd. Now, just to give you a little background on how the priests actually did this, coming out of the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, what they would do is they would have gatherings at night right after the sun went down to look for that small sliver of the moon. And when they found it, they would blow the trumpets, letting everybody know that a new month had started. Um, right there at sundown was a new month. So on this particular night, those guys would have been out there. There would have been a sunset at 829. And then the moon would have put, now went down for until 9.56. So that would have given them plenty of enough time to actually see that uh, small sliver of a moon there. So that would make the 4th of June the actual first day of the month. Now let's, let's look over here. This is also from the U.S. Naval Observatory, but this is the fraction of the moon illuminated. So you can see what percentage of the moon is, is in the sky. And so we took this information because it gives the whole year and put it over here in an Excel file. And then you come up here and look. You see right around in this area, you have the new moon falling on the third, making the fourth the first day of the month. Now that's the, the first day they had like a celebratory feast on that day. It was it, w it wasn't a work day at all by no means. This is this is the day you, if you remember the uh, story of David um, when they were looking for him at the supper and he wasn't anywhere to be found. Um, it's because Saul wanted to kill him. Well, it was during the uh, New Moon Festival. That's when that took place. But now, like I said, it was not a work day. The first day would have started here the day after. So putting the Sabbath day here on the 10th. And what do you know? You have... The Feast of Weeks falling on 11th. So that confirms the uh, next requirement that it fall on a Sabbath day. So let's put a big old X behind it. Now let's look at one of the other ones. It says, um, let's see which one we want to do. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete or the morrow after the Sabbath. So let's do this one first. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. All right, now we come over here, and um, as you can see, I've been working with this a uh, little bit here, but we come in the month of April. Now, this is when the Feast of Weeks came. Uh, I mean, the Feast of first, first Fruits. This is when you have the Feast of First Fruits. And remember, when we was looking at Leviticus uh, 23, you started counting from the day of First Fruits, which was right here on the 22nd. So you're looking at this, and we went in and put in all of the Sabbath days, and we can count them here. You have one Sabbath day here, one Sabbath day here, one Sabbath day here, and one here. Hope I didn't confuse anybody. One there. All right, those. That's. Um, I guess I confused me. I didn't even count them. That's one, two, three. Four, and then this one over here is, makes five. That's five Sabbath days. All right, so we need two more. So let's go into June. There's six right there. And then coming down here, there is seven. And right there you have the Feast of Weeks. All right. So now that takes care of not only that requirement, but that takes care of all of the requirements. All right. So the Feast of Weeks is on June the 11th, 2019. June the 11th, 2019 appears to be the um, uh, Feast of Weeks. Are you or someone you love suffering from symptoms of sadness, meanness, lust or covetousness, anger or violent temper, lying or untrustworthiness, foolishness, pride or anger, or hatred? Do you ever wonder if you are worthy of those good things you desire? 
If so, you may be suffering from chronic doubtfulness disorder. Chronic doubtfulness is a mental attitude disorder that affects how you think towards and react to life's challenges. The symptoms of chronic doubtfulness disorder are perfidiousness or unbelief, incontinence or the lack of self-restraint, infidelity or unfaithfulness, or deceitfulness. Some of the causes of chronic doubtfulness disorder are ignorance of scriptural truths. Chronic doubtfulness disorder affects millions of people around the world and if untreated can lead to relationship issues, unsuccessfulness, and a spiritual death. But do not worry, there is hope. Introducing the Shepherd of Hermas. The Shepherd of Hermas is holy scripture that teaches the principles of the Angel of Repentance. Reading, practicing, and applying these principles regularly will strengthen your spirit with the whole armor of God. This spiritual cloak of protection is woven throughout with essential virtues like faith, self-restraint, power, and patience. The Shepherd of Hermas is all you need to combat and cure chronic doubtfulness disorder. Guaranteed. Side effects will include simplicity, innocence, chastity, cheerfulness, trustworthiness. Prolonged use will cause the understanding of others, concord or harmony, and charity. Disclaimer. The actual book of the Shepherd of Hermas must be read frequently for real and lasting effects. Do not stop reading the Shepherd of Hermas or practicing its teachings before consulting the Creator. we're talking about the feast of weeks all right now we've already covered verses 15 and 16 where we calculated the time we made sure it met all of those requirements but now let's go on to 17 it says ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals they shall be of fine flour they shall be bacon with leaven they are the first fruits unto the Lord you have to understand a lot is going on when you read the book of Leviticus that you have to understand both that it really did happen and there was living people that lived through this stuff we have to understand the spiritual meaning too as well we have to understand the spiritual meaning plus that it really happened and so as we go through these I, I I almost feel like I can ignore the material like when it's talking about bread here for instance we know he's making bread this is this is like when you breed over here in the um, ESV we got over here let's see what it says you shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved yeah so we, we I think throughout this we can ignore this and try to concentrate on the spiritual meaning because we 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 found a key for bread you know everybody take a moment and think what does bread mean you know We've always understood, at least I have, always understood that bread is associated with the Word of God. The bread um, is the Word of God. So, let's see if we, what else we can pull out of here. Made by two, two tenths of an ephah. Now, that's talking about a precise measurement there. He's telling you exactly how much to, to make. They shall be a fine flour, and they shall be baking with leaven. Now, to try to understand some of the spiritual meanings out of this, you you have the bread of life, which is the word of God, made of two tenths of an ephod. So it's telling you a certain amount of bread to bring, a certain amount of bread, and they shall be a fine flour. Okay, now I don't know what fine flour. I don't have a um, I don't have one for fine flour. Um, and they shall be bacon, baked with leaven. And we know that leaven is um, doctrine, 
we know that leaven is is church doctrine to be specific it's as om almost as if he's telling the people making this offering to um, bring the word to bring the word not only just reading the word like we normally do at uh, holy convocations most convocations you read straight out of the bible tabernacles yeah <laughs> you're supposed to be reading straight out of the bible with unleavened bread you're not even you shouldn't even be allowed to talk about the bible during the feast of unleavened bread that's a week long this one on the other hand he said to bring with leaven like what i'm doing here you know what I'm saying? This what I'm doing here is leaven, where I'm taking the word of God, the pure lump that you're looking at on the screen, and I am adding my words to it. That is what I've always thought leavening was. And for like the feast of unleavened bread, and for the um, we try to you know we don't. That's why we say they don't, we don't even talk because anything we talk about dealing with the Bible is going to be you know adding this leaven to it. So we try to be quiet. But it seems like he's saying on on the feast of weeks on this particular day you're supposed to bring it. This is the preaching day. This is a day of preaching. This is a day you know you get out there and say you know um, this is what I have experienced over the last so and so amount of time probably a year because you do it every year and um but let's go on let's see what else we can pull out of the scripture before we leaven too much they shall be a fine flour and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits of the lord first fruits first fruits meaning okay you've done a lot of work so far you have you've planted You've, I mean, I ain't gonna tell you. I don't know if all everybody's um, spiritual walk involves agriculture, but you've, you, you still kind of come a long way. You've started back there, maybe in tabernacles uh, or atonement day or something like that, and then you've come around through the spring feast, and now this one is the last one making a complete year, well, then you got a lot to talk about. You got a lot of experiences and stuff that, you know, you can, you can bring out, a lot of stuff that you've learned. But, you know what? Let's go on to verse 18. If we read it all in the King James Version, ye shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. And ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young bullock, and two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord, with their meat offering and their drink offerings. Even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Okay, let's jump slam into the the spiritual meanings of this. Praise the Lord. You know, my Father, we need your help to understand this. But let's see. And ye shall offer the bread, with the bread, which is the word, seven lambs. Now, the lamb is the Messiah. So how are you offering seven lambs? I've always thought this was something like prayers, like like something you were doing the same way you, you would you're bringing this bread in this manner you have to think of the messiah now something you have to do in relationship to that fleshly being that was here on the earth for those 30 some odd years without blemish of the first year okay and of course you know the blemish is that he had no stains and of the first year um I'm 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 almost wanting to say that's talking about his first lifetime, first lifetime of his first lifetime, like his first go around, like he was he was purest of pure. Remember that you know we've lived several lifetimes here on earth, but the thing about it, up until we start to get spirit and truth, starting to get understanding, starting to get what in the world we're supposed to actually be doing and how we're supposed to be acting. Um, we've been messing things up. We've been making it worse. So brings on the tribulation. That's why we got a tribulation in the first place is that, you know, we've been bad down here and we're going to get a licking. But let's keep on going. 
and one young bullock now see I've also believed that that points to the Messiah and I believe you can find videos on that and maybe you guys can put post in the, the comments there uh, links to videos that describe some of this stuff but I believe all of these point back to the Messiah even the two rams all of them lambs which is sheep bullocks which is uh, cows and and rams which is sheep again and see now one of the things you have to understand you have to understand this poem that um, Enoch gave to uh, one of his children where he described all of humanity in the form of beasts of, you know there, there was cows there was lambs there were jackals there was hyenas hyenas there were um, um, donkeys there were in this poem and each one of these them had a meaning you have to go back to that poem anyway uh, let me go on they shall be for a burnt offering now a burnt offering is now I have heard that that's when the Messiah was put in the tomb or put on the cross that was a burnt offering him actually dying or being put in a grave one and or both was the burnt offering so now how does this read then let's 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 see we're trying to make some sense of the start over and ye shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year and one young bullock and two rams and they shall be for a burnt offering unto the lord so we said earlier that this is this is something to do with the messiah and we're doing a burnt offering so you know it just sounds like prayer to me it sounds like something to do with prayer but you obviously see i need help with it so i'm gonna go on with their meat offering now meat offering is talking about the bread it's not talking about flesh when they say meat is talking about bread it's talking about grain it's talking about something other than meat when they're actually talking about protein meat they call it flesh in the scripture you find it is flesh and their drink offerings now the drink offering that points to salvation right the remember he we were at communion um, we were offered the bread and the wine um, the wine represented his blood which is our salvation and then you have even an offering made by fire now this one I've struggled with <laughs> even an offering made by fire what exactly is the offering now when now back then if they roasted it means they actually had some stuff on the fire and it was hot and it you know you know smoky and stuff like that but this one, an offering made by fire, we've we've come up with with the spiritual meanings. Okay, we have this bread, that you know, this flat flour, this um, this meat, this grain, and now he's saying fire. What is the spiritual meaning of this fire? And then he says of sweet savior unto the Lord now that word I'm gonna look that word up okay looking this word up over here on you on Yahoo I believe but it's saying that is uh, the quality in a substance that is perceived by the sense of taste or smell and yet another one but <clears throat> when I see that I think about prayer and what the scripture says as far as incense burning and different you know smells and different stuff and it seems to um, be tied to prayer many times I don't want to take anything from the material meaning of any of these. Now, what is it actually saying materially? Okay, you got two two loaves of bread that you're gonna get, and you're gonna take them and you're gonna gonna give it to the priest. They're gonna they're gonna wave them. When they say the wave, you're gonna give it to the priest. These will be baked with leaven, 
unlike the Feast of Unleavened Bread, these are actually going to be fluffy loaves of bread. It's going to be similar to, you know, soft bread that you would, that you that were used to. Okay. Now, thing is, when you get to 18, you know, he's act, he's actually talking about seven lambs and, uh, you know, of a year with that. This is eventual, guys. When you listen to the beginning parts of Leviticus 23, it starts telling you about how the offerings and stuff is supposed to work and it also uh, tells you what is the substitute for what having seven bulls that you can sacrifice at one time is kind of like I, I don't want to say the goal but you don't start off there you kind of start off with bread actually you know when you don't have anything else you start off and then you work your way up through birds and then sheep and goats and then before you start getting into cattle is my point but you know this there is some sacrifice here okay but let's go on and you see down here you have the bread and the meat uh, bread and the wine so this is it's kind of like a communion deal you have the the uh, bread and the wine. Um, the Messiah is involved. Talking, to, you know, talking about lambs and rams. Um, but I was trying to give the materialistic meaning of it. Yeah, well, it at least sounds like a barbecue. It at least sounds like a barbecue, don't it? I mean, you you have all of these animals that you are. You have sacrificed, and now you're about to uh, use some fire to make an offering, and you know you want it to smell good, so you need to add the proper seasoning to it. And it looks like you're supposed to have some wine to go along with it and some bread. This is a barbecue, guys. When I first read the Bible, that's what I thought this was. I still do. You know, it's just hard to explain, but it seems like a barbecue, like like what we would do on one of the holidays, like. Memorial Day or um, Fourth of July or something like that where we would come together as families and friends and sit around and you know uh, um, talk and, and be merry it's just the difference is you know instead of people having you know uh, whiskey and beer you know they got wine and, and, and instead of pork butts on the grill they got you know lambs and you know and uh, clean animals on on the grill um, and instead of praising you know their money and their governments that got them you know the ability to sit there with their friends they would be praising the father that created the heaven and the earth and since this holy day we're supposed to have leavening in our bread we're going to have a word from the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug I'll bring you spirituality out of savings, doing your economic toil, its blessings at a discount, with my multi-purpose prayer oil. You see, you can pray with it. Anoint yourself. Use it like a lotion on your skin. It's also the type of oil you can pour in a pan and cook your chicken in. Let me hear you say finger licking good. And that reminds me, it's also a personal lubricant. Let me hear you say smack it up, flip it, rub it down. And it all comes back except for two tablespoons. Uh -huh. So I'm telling everybody, uh -huh. I bring you spirituality at a savings, yeah. doing your economic toil, uh -huh. it's blessings at a discount, uh -huh. with my new multi-purpose prayer oil. Uh -huh. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Let me hear you say boom shaka laka laka. Let me hear you say smack it up, flip it, rub it down. Oh, no. We say we was going to do the who, what, when, where, how, how much, you know, I, all them. And so, we're going to come back here to um, Leviticus 23 to even see who the who is, right? So, uh, coming all the way up here to verse 3. We're we'll talking about the who. We can get the who part over with. See right here where it says, The Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feast." creator is speaking to Moses and he's what is he telling Moses he says speak to the people of Israel and say to them 
Now, this is what this is about because this is the who. Who is he talking to? So who is the people of Israel? Now, to make this really quick, you know, before we start, you know, pulling out verses and books and stuff, you have to remember that these are living parables. These events actually happened. There was flesh and blood walking around. That the, There was two million of these people that was out there in the desert listening to, you know, Moses come back and tell this story, you know, and Moses wrote it down in his book, too. So this really happened. But we're in 2019, and we're saying, who is Israel? Who is Israel in 2019? Because we understand those people were scattered. And then we understand that we have... Um, been reincarnated and have been here multiple times and you have you know to where there could be Israel in any race color you know it does that that part really doesn't matter anymore now I'm trying to draw this little Venn diagram thing and I wish I could saying that there are three parts here I'm gonna have to pull out the verses these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying go not into the way of the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans into ye not all right now I'm gonna put this in, in in context because right here we understand that the world is broken up into three groups of people three groups all right the Gentiles right here the Samaritans right here and the house of Israel right here now at the time of the Messiah when this was written those were the three groups and at today's time these same three groups exist you say well who are they Okay, now back then you have to understand who they were back then. Remember, it was a living parable. It was a demonstration of what it looks like in in the fleshly. So, but you have to make the switch between the spiritual meaning of this stuff. Now, praise, praise the Father, we can. You know, we're in the third era where we can do such things. Well, so you have Gentiles, Samaritans, and Israel. So I'm just gonna tell you what I believe they are, and you know, comment. Let's talk about it in the comments. If you if you disagree, fine. Let's talk about it. But today Israel is anybody that's calling on the Father. You know, they have you have we have different degrees. Some are calling harder than others, you know, but there's 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 this people on the planet who not only believe that a father exists, a creator exists, but they're actually in in pursuit of his pleasures, meaning they're trying to please and they're trying to, you know, be on a good on his good side, so to speak. Then there is a group of people who deny him, who say that he don't he don't exist. He ain't real. He he is some fairy tale made up stuff. He's no different than what you would watch in, you know, the Avengers or, you know, stuff like that. Right here it says, and into any city of the Samaritans. Now, here's where it gets a little complicated. They said, Well, who are the Samaritans? The Gentiles are on one side of this pendulum swing, while Israel is on the other side of the pendulum swing. Samaritans are right in the middle. Samaritans are people who back then, you got to understand who the Samaritans were back then. These were the other ten tribes of, of, of Israel, the, the ten tribes that went into Assyria and assimilated into that nation, still there today. These people are... The Samaritans, they understand that the Father is real. However, they are they they are now and they were then incorporated, indoctrinated, they were inseminated into the culture around them, into the Gentile culture. So it's like they started off as being Israel and but they and when you look at their culture it looks Gentile ish. It looks like it's looking like they're Gentiles. So they're right there in the middle. And there will be various degrees of that. There will be various degrees of that back then. And so that's what you have today. But notice that we're going to add a little, we're going to narrow it down a little bit more right here. He says, when you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest to the priests. Let's, let's jump over here and read it in the King James right quick. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priests. First we narrow it down to Israel. Now we're going to have to narrow it down to when ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof. So that's what I believe he's talking about is the reincarnation here you know with us as human beings are the fertile land and the spirit 
of of the Father, the Holy Spirit being the seed, and you know, and that's why we have to take care of our bodies. Now, this is still material stuff too. You got we just gotta. I'm just trying to make sure we understand that we have both that we have to figure out here. We can't just go by um, the materialistic. We can't really just go by the material, uh, the spiritual either. You can't just concentrate on the spiritual. You have to have a balance there. So that narrows it down there, right there. That narrows it down. This is who right here. This is the who is he talking about? Okay, now to sum this up, who is it that's supposed to be keeping the Feast of Pentecost? Who is supposed to be doing this? First of all, I say that out of the three groups, Gentiles, Samaritans, and Israelites, the Gentiles are those who don't recognize the Father. Samaritans would be those who recognize the Father but are Gentilish in nature. The group that I believe that he's calling out here are the Israelites, which would be those that recognize the Father and are obedient. But I also want to point out that it does say, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof. And everybody may not feel like this. Looking at Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, looking particularly at the who, what, when and where of Pentecost this little short video is going to be about the where all right I'm going to tell you where we are to perform these feasts the feast of weeks where are we supposed to do it there's a lot of people um, who want to say we are not required to do these feasts anymore because we don't have a temple anymore but I'm going to argue that that's not the case now let's come up here we're looking at the feast of weeks we know that the Feast of Weeks is also tied very closely to the Feast of First Fruits, which starts there in verse 9. It's almost like they're the same feast. But we're going to come down here and look at one particular verse because we're going to make this a very short class. And that is verse 14. It says, And ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the self same day ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Okay, now, like I said, this is going to be a short class, and there's your answer right there, in all of your dwellings. Now, I humbly say, you know, just to kind of give myself a little bit of credibility in some of the stuff that I say, but I've read the scripture, and nowhere does it ever tell you that you had to perform these feasts in a temple. This right here, this is coming out of Leviticus 23. And we know that Leviticus was written while they were in the desert there for those 40 years. There was no temple. All they had then was a tent. There was no temple built. So to now say that because the temple has been destroyed, there should be no feast, that's, that to me doesn't line up considering when the feasts were instituted, there was no temple in existence at all. In fact, they barely had a tent. They just built a tent there at the end of Exodus. In one of the earlier classes, we were reading that Noah was even instructed about these feasts too. And he didn't have a tent, an ark, or any of that. So to me, these feasts are not tied to any temple or tied to any place at all. In fact, he's instructing us right here that we are to perform these feasts at all of our dwelling places. Trying to finish up on this um, series of classes dealing with a feast of weeks or Pentecost or Shavuot, depends on what you call it. We've already gone through a lot of these points. We've talked about the who is required to keep the feast of weeks. We talked about what we are supposed to do to celebrate the feast, and we're going to to uh, talk a little bit more about that here in a minute. We're going to talk a little bit more about what we are to do to celebrate the feast. We've already talked about when exactly the feast dates are, talked about where we are supposed to celebrate the feast. We're going to talk a little bit more about why we are to keep the feast and how we are to keep the feast. Now, these aren't in order, and so I'm going to try to pick up on these last few points as I go. Got a few more verses, so y'all stick with me.
All right, so let's pick up where we left off here at verse 19. Again, we have the ESV over there on the right-hand side. But we're going to read from the King James Version. It says, Then ye shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offering. Okay, now one of the things we have to point out is that the Feast of Weeks turns out to be a sin offering a time when we make a sin offering and we can go back to Leviticus and see what the sin offering um, entails well, one of the things that I want to point out here because I know there's a wide range of people that are listening to this some of you guys are brand new and I want want you to know um, there is sort of a build-up to the type of sacrifice you were to make for a sin offering lambs and goats are kind of far down the road as far as you know the spiritual walk is concerned because the Lord has the, the our father in heaven has to have time in order to give you these these animals to make the sacrifice but it, it doesn't really start there um, it really starts off with a bread offering or a meal offering or what the Bible calls a meat offering but you can read that back in Leviticus how it kind of starts off with meal offerings and then goes through um, birds before you ever get to lambs and goats and, and you know you can even progress up to cattle but again you, you you would have to have the father to provide you with these animals unless you have them already okay now it's up here in Leviticus chapter 4 that we read about the sin offering and what it entails I don't want to get in too deep as far as the sin offering is concerned I may do that in another video but let me stop right here verse 29 he says and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the sin offering and slay the sin offering in the place of the burnt offering and the priest shall take the blood thereof with his finger and put it upon the horns of the altar of burnt offering and shall pour out all the blood thereof at the bottom of the altar and he shall take away the fat thereof as the fat is taken away off the sacrifice of peace offering and the priest shall burn it upon the altar for a sweet savior unto the Lord and the priest shall make atonement for him for it shall be forgiven him alright now I want to point out this particular part here it is a sacrifice they are sacrificing an animal here in this picture but notice the parts that he's, he's calling out specifically and go ahead and read the whole chapter in case I'm missing something but I do want to point out that it's the fat and the blood that it that he's calling out specifically. The fat and the blood are to be done away with. He's pouring the blood out. The fat is being burned on the altar. Well, guess what you do with the rest of the animal? Well, it becomes like a a, a meal. It they eat it, you know, and. That's what a lot of these feasts are. They, they seem to be barbecues, but I covered that in another class. So I'm going to go ahead to verse 20. He says, And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord. With the two lambs, they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. Now, what's going on here is, is, is actually overly, overly simplified to the point where it's hard to believe that they're actually just, just waving this these loaves and this flesh here they're just waving it before the Lord as if the priest was to hold it up before the Lord and to hold it up before the congregation and wave it and says look look what coach has offered but then after they wave it they ate it you know it became a huge feast that's why, why they call these feast days is because they ate all of this food and we're talking a lot of people and we're talking a lot a lot of food that they that they ate during this time all right let me go on to 21 and ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be a holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statue forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Now, I know there's a lot in this, in this compilation video once I get it all put together. But as far as the how we are to um, celebrate the feast, I do want to pull out this verse right here because and give a little part of my testimony um, going all the way back um, when I first read the book of uh, Leviticus when I first read this book Exodus um, Genesis and Deuteronomy and Numbers 2 I was first of all I was by myself I didn't really have any uh, support from any other ministers or any other Bible believers or or any church people or anything like that telling me what how I was supposed to feel about what I was reading so it it, it 
I kind of took it upon myself naturally to read and comprehend what I was reading. And this is what jumped out at me first, was you shall do no servile work therein. I didn't have anything to sacrifice. I didn't have, you know, any knowledge of any of this other stuff that was going on. But I did know how to take off work and take a day of rest. And that to me was where it started off as being for many, many years when I, when I honored these feasts, when I celebrated these feasts, it was uh, merely taking off work, being by myself. And, you know, I thought about it for a while. I thought about it for a long time. Okay, how is this actually working? And to sum it up in one sentence or less, what it seems to me is like once you took off work once you put yourself in a position where you could serve the Lord away from away from the daily grind you were in a position where you could serve the Lord the Holy Spirit within is what actually went through these steps and these processes and actually done did this stuff for us it's like the Holy Spirit was performing all of these um, rituals and acts on a spiritual nature behind the scenes and all the thing I really had to do was to take off work behind it and I'm kind of leaving it up to you and the father leaving it up to you and the father to decide how you're going to actually do this but on one hand the bare minimum is you have to take off work we, 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 we did the um, calculations and the date is on uh, June the 11th so you need to go ahead and call in sick on that day call, call in vacation that day if you work for the government um, here in the United States, that's supposed to be a holiday for you. You're supposed to be able to take that out, take that day off as a religious holiday. Now, another thing I want to point out at this part right here, where he says "forever," this jumped out at me all those many years ago, and I presented this to the Reverend Pastor Deacon Dr. Doug, and I said, "You know, uh, what does forever mean? Does that mean we're supposed to stop? You know, forever means forever." And look what he says: "Throughout your generation." So we're still supposed to be doing these feasts. Forever means forever. It means it never stops. But let's go on to 22. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Okay, now this verse falls under the why too. Remember, these are harvest feasts. These are uh, harvest celebrations. Um, we go before the Lord and we, we perform these celebrations in order so so that he will bless our harvest right and it, it don't always mean agriculture you know it you know your blessings could come in other forms especially if you live nowhere close to a farm you can imagine that your blessings will come in other forms or uh, you know it could be related to the type of work that you could you do or it could be related to the ministry that you do or it could be related to just your 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 personal quality of life and you know how things are going for you it could be but it is a agricultural type feast it is a harvest feast and like I said over the years I have matured and now I do actually have fields of uh, food growing I have um, I live on a off-grid homestead now praise the Lord um, and I attributed the acquisition of that farmland to these feasts I, I actually do I got I got the land during the Jubilee year and uh, I can look back at the previous years, not years, but the previous year, I'm going to say 2014 and 2015, when I really started, you know, trying to perform the feast to the letter that, you know, I found myself, you know, getting a piece of land and now we grow stuff. And so why do we keep all of the feasts or why do we keep in particular the Feast of Weeks is so that we can we can have an abundant harvest but look what he's saying here in 22 he says and when you reap the harvest of the land meaning after you've gotten the harvest you've gone through these feasts you've you've um, um, prepared yourself you know spiritually using using the uh, scripture there as a blueprint to prepare yourself and and now you know we're expecting to get a harvest but look what he says here he says and thou shalt make and thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of that field when thou reapest. Let me come up here to the ESV and see what it says. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to the edge, meaning that you should leave one. This is about sharing, guys. 
we, we, we've done the feast so we can have an abundant harvest but look what he's telling us right here at the end of the feast it's like it's like it really doesn't belong here but he's he's telling us okay now that you have gotten this abundant harvest he's saying to share it to get it to to make sure that those who are less fortunate have the opportunity to come to your field and pick some of your vegetables he's saying when you go out there to harvest your vegetables leave some out there so it's saying right there, nor shall you gather the gleanings after the harvest. Meaning you don't after you've after you've harvested your field, you don't go back there and pick it clean. You don't back go back out there and make sure there's nothing left. You actually do leave some food out there. That is a biblical requirement to leave food in your field. Alright? Then it says, You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Alright? All right, so the feast of weeks. We have who is who is required to keep the feast of weeks. Now we talked about this earlier. It is the Israelites. The Israelites are required to keep the feast. Um, you can put a caveat on it, or the scripture does. You know, give you give room for a caveat that says if you have um, received the land and gotten a harvest. But I would be careful with that because. You know, he may be talking about on a spiritual nature and we could mess up if we if we make the assumption that he's talking about material harvest and say, well, I haven't seen any harvest when he's actually talking about a spiritual harvest. And turns out you have an abundance of that. You could be an error and you could find yourself going backwards if you miss that feast. I realize I'm trying to pack as much information in this video as I possibly can, but I wanted to pull out Deuteronomy 16 and 16 before I close it out. And it's talking about three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, in the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Let me pull out, pull out a few points here. Because I think it's really important. One is he's talking about these three times in a year. And he names them down there. Unleavened bread, weeks, and tabernacles. Those are three mandatory feasts. They are considered mandatory feasts. All of thy males. See what it says right there. All of thy males must appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose. Now, in the place where he should, shall choose, I always, you know, looked at that like, what did, what did he mean by the place that he shall choose? And it's really only now in the third era that we understand that he's talking about. He's talking about that spiritual temple, a temple that lives inside of us. It's the the, the uh, brick and mortar temples have all been knocked down, and but we do understand that the third temple will be built on our heart, and this is the place that he's choosing, and this is the place that he's talking about. And then the last point in there, he says, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Yeah, again, these are sacrificial feasts, guys. What are we to do to celebrate the feast? Well, the the um, first of all is taking off work. That's one of the main things is taking off work. Another thing would be prayer and uh, and and it looked like there was a bit of communion mixed in with it. But there's several other rules. There's actually sacrifices involved in it. Now I'm not gonna. I don't want to take this video to push any type of sacrifices or anything like that because you know I don't know what you have or what you're capable of and all of that kind of stuff. But you know that that lines up with what we are supposed to be doing all right when is the exact date of the feast we said it was june the 11th june the 11th is the exact date and um where are we supposed to celebrate the feast in your in your own home you know we say these are like barbecues but you're not really going to expect the whole community to show up i don't care how much food and wine you have they're just not going to come out for a holy day feast. So it's going to be amongst you and probably your family, you know, there at your home, you know, that you will perform this feast. Not necessarily, you know, we don't have to have a temple or we don't have to have a tent or something that we don't travel off to go do these feasts like they've done in the past. We do them in our dwelling places, in all of our dwelling places. Then it says, why are we to keep the feast? These are harvest feasts. We, we serve the Lord in this manner so that we can receive uh, those blessings that he has in store for us um, we really can't expect to receive um, any type of harvest whether it's a uh, material harvest or a spiritual harvest unless we are obedient to his statutes and these this is one of his statutes the uh, feast of weeks how are we supposed to celebrate the feast 
let me just talk for the guys who are brand new, the guys who, you know, have no opportunity, no real opportunity to, to make any type of sacrifices. Um, just make sure you take the day off. Make sure you take the day off work. Um, and, you know, spend some some time away from anything that could distract you. Like it may not be the day to go shopping. It's not the day to, you know, wash the truck or whatever. Take the day off work and spend some time in prayer. Might I add, this would be a good time to read scripture. And you should consider reading the Third Testament of the Bible. Or even listening to the audio version over there on YouTube. So that the, so that the, the spirit inside of you can do its work. So it can go before the Father and get the necessary atonement for you. But I'm going to go ahead and get this posted up. If you have any questions, please leave them below. If you have any comments, please leave them below. Any clarifications or anything, we, we, we appreciate uh, you know all you guys for making your comments and such. All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and get this posted up. Y'all pray for us. Hermes Academy. Power of patience, continence, and faith. We teach virtues.